Hello, I'm Harley Schlanger. Welcome to our weekly dialogue with Helga Zeppelin Roosh, the founder and chairwoman of the Schiller Institute. It's May 19th, 2022. Helga, it seems as though each day there's a, another major provocation launched against Russia as the Biden administration, members of both parties in Congress, the governments of the NATO countries in Europe, uh, they're all moving closer to crossing another red line uh, made or identified by President Putin and his security team. This week began with the governments of Finland and Sweden announcing their intention to join NATO. How is Russia responding to this? And are they not aware that these are moving directly against the red lines outlined by President Putin? Well, I think they don't, they don't care, you know. I mean, the fact that, I mean, there is no threat to Sweden and Finland. Anybody who thinks that, that the Russians are about to, uh, you know, fall into these countries is completely, uh, you know, off the wall. And the fact that, you know, this is the sixth NATO East expansion. We should remember that on December 17th, uh, Putin had demanded from the United States and NATO binding legal security guarantees that NATO would not continuously move eastward, that Ukraine would not become a NATO member, and that no offensive weapon systems would be put at the border uh, of Russia. And, you know, I think that it is the Swiss analyst, uh, military analyst, uh, Jacques Beau. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It was the former head of the, of the uh, Italian Air Force, uh, General Tricarico, who just said, you know, this thing about, you know, NATO application of uh, Finland and Sweden is like poking another, another time a finger in Putin's eye. And I think, you know, the various uh, Russian spokesmen have already said that they will take comp compensatory measures. They probably will put some, you know, weapon systems uh, close to the Finnish and Swedish border or some equivalent of that. But, you know, it is one more uh, escalation and, you know, the reaction by the Russians are becoming more hardline, more, more, you know, recognizing what the situation is. For example, the head of the Russian Security Council, uh, Patrushev, uh, basically said that, you know, the reason why Russia had to do what they call um, limited military action in Ukraine is because the, these continuous moves by NATO towards the east, towards, you know, encirclement of Russia uh, was putting the existence of the Russian state at risk. And, you know, this is a formulation which, you know, should alarm anybody in, in the West, because that was what Deputy Foreign Minister Khrushchev had said uh, last month. Uh, that is the condition where Russia uh, has a, a doctrine which allows the, uh, according to its own rules, the use of nuclear weapons. Now, I don't think that Russia is going to use nuclear weapons, but, you know, it's like one provocation after the other. And, you know, we should not be surprised if uh, this thing goes uh, totally wrong at a, at a very soon moment, if we cannot mobilize a resistance against this. But the Russians have made very clear um, that, you know, the aim is to eradicate the Russian system, to completely, you know, have regime change, to put in a, a regime which is uh, basically, you know, controlled by the West. And that naturally is not acceptable uh, to the Russian leadership. So this is a, an absolute terrible provocation and people should really be alarmed because this is the road to disaster. You mentioned Patrushev. There was also statements from Ryabkov and some very sharp responses from Putin on the fact that the Russians will survive economically and, and advance. But apparently there's, there's no one listening in the Biden administration. No, I think they, they are just uh, moving ahead. And unfortunately, they have gotten the German government completely in their pocket. Uh, 
Chancellor Scholz uh, repeats almost mindlessly this idea that Russia will not be allowed to win this war in Ukraine. Um, now, let me bring in another element um, because there is something going on which does not meet the eye or, you know, if you want to close your eyes, you don't see it <laughs> at all, but there is something very smelly. Patrushev not only said what I just mentioned, but he, in his remarks, also said that we are experiencing in front of our eyes the rapid transformation of the liberal system into a neoliberal fascism. Now, I know that this is uh, <coughs> something people don't want to, to look at, but there are very ominous signs. Uh, and one of them is people are very upset, especially in the United States, about the murder which just occurred some days ago in Buffalo, where an 18-year-old uh, killed 10 people, wounding some more. And he had put out a manifesto of 180 pages where he has very prominent on the cover, the so-called sun wheel or black sun, which is a insignia, which is used by Nazis. Uh, it, you know, and he has a reference to that. Uh, and that is the same symbol, which is also used by the Azov Brigade in, in Ukraine. It was used by the murderer, the, uh, you know, the assassin of the Christchurch uh, terrorist attack in 2019, where 51 Muslims were killed. And in each case, you have the same racist theory behind it. In the case of the Azov, that the Russians are inferior and have to be, you know, fought. And in, in the case of the Buffalo case, it was against the so-called replacement theory of the white people are being replaced by colored people. And this is one of the hardcore of Nazism, which is this idea of, you know, racism and, and the inferiority of, of the non-white races. Now, the big question, I mean, naturally, every time you say this, the mainstream media are saying this is all Russian propaganda. But that's absurd because we followed all of this, uh, you know, way back in 2014 when the Maidan coup happened and, you know, <clears throat> There were eyewitnesses who reported that maybe only 10% of the Maidan demonstrators were from the Azov uh, battalion or the right sector. But, you know, as some of their spokesmen said, it was their, uh, you know, aggressiveness which made sure that the Maidan ended up in the coup and didn't end up in a, in a soccer picnic or something like that. And, you know, we have studied this, you know, the the whole Bandera networks in uh, Ukraine, they were kept by the Western intelligence services, by the MI6, by the CIA, by the BND, the Galen operation. They had put up headquarters in Munich. Uh, Bandera joined the uh, MI6 uh, in, in 47. Uh, they were kept as the anti-Bolshevik bloc of nations uh, for the potential Conf confrontation with the Soviet Union. And later they moved, uh, Mrs. Stetsko moved into Ukraine and she built up this new movement. I mean, this is not Russian propaganda. We followed that quite independently throughout these uh, years. And uh, the fact that, I mean, there is no way how Western governments, uh, for example, you know, one day before the Maidan coup happened in 2014, Steinmeier, Silurski, uh, and Fabius, the Polish, German, and French foreign ministers, were in in uh, Kiev. Uh, there is no way how they didn't know that, and it is a big scandal that the West is not admitting that, but basically is working with these elements in order to destroy Russia. Well, there there are two aspects to that. I think I just referring back to your comment about something smelly about this. One is your, your husband identified the policies coming from the Western policymakers as being shocked in fascism. And these are the economic policies, the austerity, the treatment of people like slaves or chattel, 
And I think that's one aspect of what we're seeing. But the other one that's really quite amazing is what just happened with this disinformation governance board, which while it appears as though it's temporarily paused and the leading disinformation specialist is on a hiatus, uh, Jankowicz, what is now coming out is that she was working directly with British networks, the Integrity uh, Initiative, and working with neo-Nazis in Ukraine to deny that there were Nazis in Ukraine and say this was Russian propaganda. And now we're hearing from that the U.S. may be bringing in ISIS fighters to fight in the war. Uh, we just had the Avastol uh, surrender. So this story is going to come out, isn't it? The whole role of the Nazis, uh, they can't cover it up. Well, a couple of years ago, there were 40 congressmen in the U.S. Congress who uh, basically made a motion uh, that these Nazis should not be armed. Um, uh, that's a fact, you know. Uh, it was published in several newspapers at the time. And now where the Biden administration uh, is trying to get $40 billion for new weapons uh, to Ukraine, there are some, you know, like Rand Paul, Senator Rand Paul, he wanted to have an inspector general to uh, to observe where is this money going because there were even articles in the mainstream media such as the Washington Post a little while ago saying that, you know, the, quoting even the Pentagon saying that they only deliver these weapons to the Polish border and what happens to these weapons afterwards, nobody knows. There is the suspicion that there is a gigantic illegal weapon trafficking market uh, occurring and you know I think there is brewing something which which could become a gigantic security risk for all of Europe and you know other places like the United States as well so I think this is really incredibly uh, and you know the Russians are now looking at that they charge that uh, the United States is training ISIS terrorists you know, some were released from a Kurdish uh, uh, jail in, in Syria uh, to bring them in for sabotage operations inside Ukraine. Now, this is unbelievable. Then there were um, now about 1,000 people surrendered from the steel plant in Mariupol. The Russians have already said that they will uh, do a, a very intensive counterintelligence job to find out what is the association of these people because many of them could be such mercenaries hired, uh, you know, for, for sabotage and, and fighting reasons. This is all extremely dirty, but I think the, the fact that the Western governments are right now following this is, is, is so absolutely scandalous that one can only say that, you know, parliamentarians in Europe uh, and naturally in the United States they must investigate this because this is this is the prehistory of World War III. And, you know, since there is a good chance that if it comes to World War III, there will be no risk, nobody left to investigate it. It's better to investigate it now. Wow. Yeah. You know, I, I, this uh, Rand Paul amendment to set up an inspector general to track where the weapons are going. It only got 11 votes, 11 Republican senators supported him. So the rest of them gave an open passage for this, these weapons to go to Ukraine, where some of them will end up in the hands of these Nazi brigades. At the same time, the Democrats are wringing their hands about guns getting to right-wing neo-Nazis in the United States. So the, the hypocrisy is there for anyone to see. Now, also on hypocrisy, Helga, people who are saying this war must end, especially in Europe, nevertheless are involved in a sabotage of the negotiations. What do you have on that? Well, you know, uh, this uh, Swiss analyst, um, uh, Jacques Beau, uh, he, in an interview, revealed and gave actually the chronology again, that at various points already uh, in March and then again in April, when Zelensky was practically, uh, you know, ready to start a serious negotiation process, one time in Turkey, another time uh, more in general, it was always two days later that the EU 
uh, gave uh, 500 million for new weapons and naturally that completely then sabotaged the negotiations. And, you know, obviously there are people in the West who don't want this war to end through peace negotiations, but they want to have it go on with the expl explicit aim to, uh, to destroy Russia, to defeat Russia, to have regime change in Russia. And um, I think that is, uh, that is really something which should be picked up by, you know, the peace movement, uh, which is emerging, you know, there is, a, fortunately, there are more people writing open letters, uh, warning of World War III. Uh, Marie Le Pen, for example, in France uh, warned, you know, that we must stop this before World War III happens. But, you know, it's, um, it is not yet at the level necessary. On the acts to sabotage the negotiations, there was a very fascinating dialogue conducted by podcaster Garland Nixon with uh, Ray McGovern and Scott Ritter, in which uh, Ritter made the point that all these weapons that are being delivered uh, are changing the relations in, in the battle in Ukraine, that while the Russians are still moving somewhat effectively with their targeted special military operations in the East, the Ukrainian military is able to reconstitute itself and will be able to conduct counterinsurgency action to bleed Russia dry. Now, also, I think it was interesting that Ritter made the comment that was exactly what you said in our last webcast, that there are people in the U.S. military and defense establishment who are preparing to fight a nuclear war and believe we could win that. And this came up in an article in Politico. Uh, what do you have to comment about the Ritter-McGovern discussion and also this nuclear war question? Well, I think the, the thing which should really get everybody alarmed is that, you know, the West seems to be like lemmings towards the cliff, you know, running towards the self-destruction. I mean, Putin in this uh, meeting he had with his cabinet said that the whole sanctions policy um, and, you know, leading to fuel price inflation um, are like an auto da fe. Uh, you know, this is the practically the execution of a, of, a, of a fine, of a judgment which has been made where the West is now self-burning on, on, a, on, a, on a stake uh, because it hurts the West, Europe in particular, more than, than Russia. Uh, so there is a suicidal element in what the West is doing. Uh, which expresses itself, for example, in the fact that there are now more and more people saying, yeah, nuclear war, uh, okay, we risk it, but that, so be it, you know, we can't, we can't allow the Russia to, uh, to do what they're doing, even if what we do has the risk of leading to nuclear war. I mean, this is the end of mankind, you know, there is, I mean, then in, in the German TV the other day, uh, they discussed, you know, are there enough bunkers, you know, uh, what do you do, you know, when there is a nuclear fallout? I mean, it is almost like that, that all this talk is supposed to get people acquainted to the fact that it's an inevitable uh, cause of action. Politico, which you mentioned, you know, they just had an article where they discussed the three scenarios of, you know, how the use of nuclear weapons could be used. All of it naturally not very much realistic. Uh, one that the Russians would detonate a nuclear device in space very far away. Uh, another one to detonate it over Ukraine, uh, which would be an even stronger signal or even throw it on the soil, on the territory of Ukraine. And then they say, oh, Biden should then not retaliate in, in kind. This is all extremely irresponsible talk. I mean, if you study this question seriously, which, which I have, you know, once you start to use one single nuclear weapon, the Russians have put in uh, a doctrine, knowing what they are up against, uh, whereby there is an automatism that if they, if they perceive that there is a nuclear attack, there's the second strike will go in full effect. And that's the end of ma mankind. So these people who are saying these things and mindlessly bubbling this uh, nonsense, you know, they're really risking the extinction of, of uh, civilization. Well, one of those people just babbling is Steny Hoyer, 
who has been saying in the Congress, he's someone very close to Biden, who's saying we're already at war. Do uh, you have any comments about that? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, there was another congressman, uh, Congressman Messi, who said, what is this? You know, he did not vote uh, for for war, which is the task of Congress to do. And then when somebody asked uh, Jen Psaki uh, about the Hoyer uh, comment, uh, she did not say no, we did not go for a declaration uh, of war. She said she praised the heroic attitude of the American people being more or less, you know, inadvertently admitting that there is something like war uh, already going on. So I think this is really, uh, you know, there are these people who, who are criminally saying things which, which contribute to the escalation, like this unspeakable so-called foreign minister of Germany, Baerbock, uh, who is running around um, now? She accuses Russia to be responsible for the famine in this third world. Uh, the famine is the result of IMF policies of not allowing development for a very long time. Then we had the pandemic, and then we have the sanctions against Russia. And you know, it's true that the Russians are blocking right now the Ukrainian ports. But the majority of these policies are the result of sanctions everywhere. So, you know, I think it's it's really high time that, uh, you know, people wake up and uh, we have to have a change in, in, in course. You know, I can, I would like to, to say something to make people feel more at ease, but this is the most dangerous situation we have ever had in, in the history of mankind. And what is at stake is the possible annihilation of civilization. Just one note additional on Baerbock, her party, the Greens, are the ones who are deliberately cutting back farm production, supposedly to protect against carbon dioxide release, and are also demanding the cutback in fertilizer and, and, and other modern farming methods which are necessary to produce food. They're attacking the German and the French farmers. Uh, just one more uh, question on, on the situation in Europe. Uh, you mentioned in France there has been some uh, comments. Henri Guénaud, the former, uh, I guess, advisor to Sarkozy, has made some uh, fairly interesting statements in the last couple of days. Yes, he, he basically is also warning. He said that France should veto uh, the uh, entering of uh, Finland and Sweden into NATO. He said, you know, that this will cause a terrible reaction from uh, from Russia. Uh, he said NATO was created to be an anti-Soviet Union, anti-Warsaw Pact uh, military uh, organization. And when the Soviet Union disintegrated, it should have been dissolved. But instead, it was turned into an anti-Russian uh, organization. And, you know, this is uh, that's what it is right now. And, you know, the, the Russophobia which is created, I can only uh, tell people that they should really think twice to put every Russian composer, poet, uh, author, you know, basically on the list of, of people who cannot be mentioned anymore and to, to create such a hatred against the Russian people, it is it is only war propaganda and has really nothing to do with the reality of the Russian people. So I can only say that the, you know, the present attitude, you know, NATO should be dissolved. It should be replaced with uh, international security and uh, development architecture, which takes into account the interest of every single country on the planet. This is what we had as a subject at our Schiller conference in April. We very soon will have another conference uh, reinforcing this subject because the only way how we will get out of this is through negotiations, through diplomacy, and you know, to, to create an order which, which brings order back in the world. The idea of an unipolar world where the United States and the British are bullying the rest of the world, you know, you know, fortunately. Uh, President uh, W. Bush had a slip of the tongue where he said this terrible war in Iraq, uh, Ukraine. So he he's had a Freudian slip um, 
which you know sometimes the truth comes out in unexpected ways. But you know this present course that needs to be uh, changed, and you know we are appealing really to anybody who sees this danger to join our effort to create a completely different approach, which has to be addressing uh, the actual causes of the war, which is the fact that the neoliberal transatlantic system is blowing out. Um, the hyperinflation is is galloping away. We are heading towards a total catastrophe because you know more and more people cannot afford food, fuel, uh, food, and more and more people are getting really mad about why should we arm uh, the Ukrainian Nazis when there is no money for the pensioners, no money for in the United States for baby formula, no money for you know to address the real crisis in Yemen, in Afghanistan, in, in Haiti. For all of this, there is no money, but millions and or billions uh, are being uh, there to, to, to stir the pot for the World War III with the Russians. And, and I think this will lead to a social explosion because you know, people will, will recognize that their fundamental interest is not taken care anymore by the governments. And that's a very dangerous uh, situation. And the only, only solution is to put an agenda on the table. You know, as I said, we need a, a conference in the, in the spirit of the Peace of Westphalia um, to, to negotiate a peace which is satisfactory for all parties. Now, just one final note on Europe. There was a report today that they're considering in Switzerland joining NATO, which would end I don't know, is it an 800 year tradition or so of neutrality? The, Helga, the question that comes up, which you've just been addressing in the last couple of minutes, is what can people do about this? Besides the larger Schiller Institute conference, it will be sometime in, later in June. There are events coming up, including May 25th in, in Stockholm and May 26th, an online conference, which will include among others, uh, Colonel Black, uh, Ray McGovern and you. Uh, what what can people do to become a part of building this movement, which instead of letting it just become a social explosion, which goes into anarchy and chaos, can actually organize to achieve the goal of a new security and financial architecture? Well, first of all, um, people should have the um, demand on themselves to really study the causes of this. Because the problem is that the mainstream media is on a complete black propaganda and every, anything which they report has a twist. You can't watch TV anymore or listen to the radio or read the newspaper because it's all, you know, this is typical in times of war. It's all black propaganda to aim uh, to serve the aims of, of the war. So when we have these coming events next week, uh, there is an event centered in Copenhagen and, and Stockholm, where we will have um, uh, analysts and, and experts to discuss why the entering of Sweden and Finland uh, into NATO is a very bad idea and should not happen. Now, everybody who is concerned about that should really tune in uh, because, you know, this is uh, a very important event. Then the next day already, on the 26th, uh, we will have uh, a, a Zoom conference with uh, Senator Richard Black, who gave uh, the interview to Schiller Institute a couple of weeks ago. It has now half a million viewers uh, and is still going up uh, by the day because he, people appreciate the fact that you have a patriotic American, a Republican, uh, somebody who is not a lefty or not, not a peacenik, but somebody who is proud to have had a long military ca career, but who completely is disgusted at the, uh, the cold-bloodedness with which the recent wars, interventionist wars, have been conducted. And he's warning of, of World War III. Uh, so Senator Black will be there. Ray McGovern uh, is known to a lot of people internationally as being one of the founders of the VIPs, the Veterans for, in, for Sanity and Intelligence. Uh, these are people who have been part of the security establishment of the United States, but who have turned away from the shifts which have occurred there. 
Um, then we have um, General Tricarico, former head of the US uh, from the it Italian Air Force, uh, who has been warning again and again, almost daily now in, in Italian TV about the consequences of uh, what is uh, happening. And then we probably also will have a very important uh, a French analyst uh, from a leading think tank in France. So listen to the opinion and, and insights of these experts and then help to spread it because you know there is such an enormous amount of uh, disinformation and lack of, of real intelligence that to inform yourself is the very first step and then join with the Schiller Institute to fight for the solution, which can only be to address the collapsing financial system and to help to put a different system on the agenda. But become active, don't sit on the on the fence because you know it's our future which is at stake. And the first step in becoming active is go to the schillerinstitute.com website and register for the May 26th online conference and then send that link to everyone you know who can't understand how we have $40 billion to arm Ukrainian Nazis and can't figure out how to deliver baby formula to new mothers and their children. So Helga, thank you very much. This has been a very compelling half hour and I hope people will also share this interview uh, so that your words can go out to more and more people. Yes, till, till soon and get active. <laughs>